uh, he's, he is a very sophisticated guy. And so he, uh, he's really been a good intern. Uh, he's worked with us, worked on the buses, he's worked in the children's service, worked with Jamie with the youth. And so he's been busy in that respect. He's from Indiana, uh, finished up a master's degree, is that correct? Master's. And uh, now wants to uh, go and work as a youth, youth minister himself and uh, also be involved in, in, in counseling, uh, spiritual counseling in that respect. So uh, just, just a good guy, just an all around good guy. And I believe he's saved, and so he's going to do something. <laughs> All right, yes, thank you so much, Pastor, for this opportunity to preach. Um, I appreciate it greatly. Um, yeah, so how about that song, Jesus Never Fails? Uh, as they were singing that, I just think through different times in my life that it's just, you feel like there's no other hope, but you can always turn back to Christ. It is such a blessing, such a blessing. It's never, ever fail. All right, so... Um, the journalist uh, Kamisha Alsir wrote, My husband and sons told me of a father and son duo they had met while attending a men's event at church. The son was about four years old and was fascinated by his dad. The little boy wanted to do everything just the way that his father did. The father, I mean the boy, mimicked his father so exactly that and so intentionally and so consistently that it captivated the attention of my husband and delighted my two teenage sons. They said, the little boy sat at the table and tried to position himself so that he was sitting just like he saw his dad sitting. If the boy saw his dad greet someone with a hug, he, went, he wanted to give that person a hug the same way his dad did. When the lad saw his dad shake hands with someone, the son shook hands with that person in the same way. When the dad nodded at someone so, to say hi, the son nodded too. There even came a point when the little boy even tried to stack folding chairs that were way too big for him because he saw his dad doing it. And his dad came over to help him put the chairs away correctly. The son was enamored and awe-inspired by his dad. He was also so confided and confident in his dad's judgment and the protection he knew his dad would provide that he wasn't slowed down in the greeting of strange people. He didn't give a second thought to who he was hugging or shaking hands with. The little boy was so absolutely convinced of two things. That his dad had everything under control and he wanted to be just the title of the message tonight is Christ is he seen in you Christ is he seen in you so let's go ahead and pray dear Lord we thank you so much for this opportunity that you gifted me with the privilege and responsibility to present and uh, expound on your word Lord um, and to explain your word I pray that you would be with my mind my heart that it be in the right place and attitude tonight, Lord, that you be in with all of our hearts, Lord, as your word is presented, the power is in your word. It's not in what I say, it's not in how well I can put words or phrases together, or how I can tickle the ears of the audience, Lord, it's all about what you are doing through your word. And I pray that you would work tonight. And it's with your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, the purpose of this message, as it is titled, um, Christ is he seen in you, the purpose is, what does it mean to reflect Christ, and how do I reflect him? So what does it mean to reflect Christ? The definition of reflecting is to embody or represent something in a faithful or appropriate way. Another definition is, of a mirror or shining surface, show an image of. So it's, it's to embody and represent this figure or this image in a duplicated way so that it's not distorted it is represented accurately for what you are representing in essence we are Christ's representatives to the world Christ was the example of reflecting someone who was given greater recognition and stood in the place as worthy of such honor in John 12 44 and 45 he says Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. 
And he that say, seeth me, seeth him that sent me. We see that Christ reflected his Father to the world in such a perfect manner. That there was no need to see the countenance of his Father, but instead, the countenance was seen through Christ. God's countenance was seen through Christ. There was, his disciples said, let us see the Father. And, they, and Christ's response was, there is no need to see the Father because you have seen me. Amen. He reflected his Father in such perfection that there was no need for God's physical being to be there when his representative, his son, was present with him. Which then, it comes back to the purpose in living this life. Bringing glory to God as our purpose for life. Pointing all things back to bringing recognition to God. That is true glory. When we are taking and living our lives in a way that shows and proves God to be true. If we can do what we do for the glory of God, that means you're living a life that is pure. That's living a life according to Scripture. You have enough knowledge of the Savior that you know how to act like the Savior. And when so doing, you're proving His righteousness, His purity, His justice, His awe. And you are representing that to the world. That is bringing God glory. And Ecclesiastes 12, 14 says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. That fear is not just an element of, I, I'm putting Him in, in His proper place. But it's recognizing that proper place. It's recognizing the place that God stands high and lifted up above ourselves and that he deserves to be reflected. He deserves to be represented to the world in perfection. That is what is it. That's what that verse is saying. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. The entirety of life is this. Fear God and keep his commandments. Put him in proper place and keep his commandments because he deserves to be obeyed. For this is the whole duty of man. Just as the little boy in the story wanted to do everything, be everything, and look just like his father, so this is the truest definition of what it means for us to be reflecting Christ. So that is that comes back to um, what does it mean to reflect Christ? To be a representative accurate to who Christ is. Just as this little boy wanted and desired to be exactly like his father. That's how we are to reflect Christ. That is reflecting. Now, how do I, point two basically, how do I reflect Christ? Question, how are we to reflect such a perfect triune as the second member of the Godhead deity, Jesus Christ? One that stands above any kind of man in perfection. How can you do that? The answer to that is you cannot. If you are doing it on your own. It is impossible to, sorry, just, maybe I should have got that little bit of help. Uh, uh, but it is impossible to reflect a perfect Christ without first being made perfect through Christ. Through the regeneration of the soul, born again through the substitutionary atonement of Christ on the cross, paying for your sins. Hebrews 11, 6 says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So, not only does this mean that we cannot represent Christ without first experiencing his saving grace. But the positive side is also true. Once you are redeemed through him, then you are given the power to represent him, to show him true in your life. God provides everything that you need to accurately represent him. And he says that without me, apart from me, it is impossible to please God. So therefore it is impossible to represent him. For 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit 
of the Lord. It is only through Christ that we are made to where we can reflect Christ. But then this still calls us to action. Not only are we regenerated, so that, that, that has to take place. You have to, through grace, through the redemption power of Christ, believing in Christ that he died on the cross for your sins, that he rose in victory over death, proving he is God and he has power over death and hell. If you believe in that, you are born again, regenerated, made a new man, woman in Christ. So once that is taking place, you now have the power of Christ upon you to where you then can represent him. And until that happens, you cannot. But even after that takes place, you're still called to take action. And that action comes by, and it being a representation, that comes by choice. You have to choose uh, how to represent that person. I have all the head knowledge I want, and all the head knowledge and understanding that I want of what I know I should be doing. A lot of us really do. If we've grown up in churches, we've grown up in, like I've grown up in church my entire life, or to raise into a Christian home, and I've, I've been taught the Bible from, from baby toddler up to my 20, almost two days away from being 26, 26 year old life. And I've been taught from that. I've been to Bible college, I've been now, I'm graduating from seminary this spring. None of that to my own glory, but all of that to illustrate. I still have to choose to act upon the knowledge of which I've gained in order to reflect accurately Christ. With the more knowledge you're given, the more responsibility you are then given to accurately reflect the Savior in whom you claim to serve. So I have compiled a list of five characteristics of Christ that we are to reflect in the, to those around us. And these five are not extensive. Um, there is so much. We could be here for hours going over the things that Christ represents in character and his purity. But I've chosen just five of these five of these characteristics that I think are very important, as they all are important, but um, as I said, we're limited on time. So we're going to go over five characteristics of how we are to reflect Christ. That is one, he is humble. In Philippians 2, 5 through 11, it says this, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. But then it goes on, and it even says this, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So not only does he humble himself to the point of taking on the form of a servant, his own creation, which is so mind-boggling, that he would care enough to come down and try to redeem mankind, his, in a way you would think, failed creation. I would just wipe it out and start new. But instead, he chooses and sees fit to come down to earth, taking on the own form of a decrepit human servant as this, so that he could die at the hands of his own servants. And that not only was that his, the humility of which Christ came to bear, but still, in the end, God says, I will exalt his name above all else, but for this purpose, to bring glory to God the Father. Still, it's still everything. His humility is so perfect. It brings no recognition, in essence, to himself, but brings all glory to his Father. Amen. If Christ was not willing to humble himself to the point of the cross, then Christianity, as we know it, would have never existed. The same aspect of humility um, leads into and leads into the next characteristic that we're studying. So the first one is humility. We are to reflect Christ in that same manner of humility. Second characteristic is this. He is a servant. John 15, 5, and then skipping a few verses because we have Peter um, being Peter. So we're skipping a few verses going to 12 through 17. It says this, and that's John 13. It says this. After that, he poured, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. 
and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was buried. So this is after the Last Supper. They've just finished. Judas, Judas is already, um, the devil has entered Judas, I should say, and then he's already gone about to go do his business. And then Christ is now um, stripped down to a loincloth, and he's now serving his disciples by washing their feet. And he goes on and says this, So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you. Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, The servant is not greater than the Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. God charged, Christ himself charges this to his, his own disciples. And he basically says, I, as an example, have now humbled myself to the point of the lowliest of servants. The ones that would go wash someone's feet in as the servant in charge of washing people's feet or their guest's feet in their house at that time was one of the lowest jobs. And you can imagine how smelly those feet would be. I, I'm, I, I'm, if you're like me, I am very sensitive to smells. So, and I actually worked at a dairy farm, so I don't know how I got through that, actually. But, um, you just become desensitized a little bit. But there's something about feet, man. That's, that's nasty business. But when it comes to that element of, that was the position of one of the servants. They were to go and wash their, their guest's feet, and Christ took that point of a servant to wash his own disciples' feet. And he says, as I am an example, do this to each other. That's our call. That's, that's a charge on us to be in humility, as we saw the first characteristic, to then be a servant, as we see in this next one. To then be servants for each other. And well, most of all, through it all, servants for Christ. Amen. So we see that, that he was humble. We see he is a servant. And the third, he is forgiving. Oh, and this one hits me right between the eyes, guys. Uh, he is forgiving. Mark 2, 5 says, um, When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. In Luke 23, 34, hmm, he made the greatest statement. Then Jesus said, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his garment. And cast lots. Christ forgave us even when he was on the point of destruction. He's still out of forgiveness. I mean, what truer form of forgiveness could you ever see exemplified in creation or throughout all of mankind than a Savior who already has humbled himself to the point of getting to the cross through the beatings, through the, through the scoffings, through the mocking, through the false accusations, everything of which he was as a king came down from that to then take upon the form of a servant, to be placed in all of this chastisement, to be then suffer at the hands of his own, his, his own creation, hanging on a cross, to then ask his Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And man, does this hit me even worse when I go and I fall back into sin, and I go and do something I shouldn't be doing, and I, I, tell, my, and I tell myself, God, forgive me. But the problem is, I know I shouldn't be doing it. It's like, how could you then forgive me, Lord, even though I know I shouldn't be doing it? And I still went back to it. At least on the cross, he could say, they know not what they do. But still, he still forgives nonetheless. And that is the forgiveness he offers. That's the forgiveness that he exemplifies, that we are to be bestowing on all of his words. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little closer about this one, but keep me with this. <laughs> There is um, several things, and I'm not trying to get too personal in this one, um, bushy, but there's several things that I've gone through, even recently in life, where I'm like, God, I don't know how I can forgive this person. The <coughs> has done so much that it feels like to me that I'm like, how could I do that? But he still asks me to do it. Yeah. Think of it this way, too. <laughs> And he still forgives us for it. Amen. That's
that's pretty awesome. We are to be reflecting that characteristic of Christ, and that is to be no matter what the cost or the call, the challenge, the harm, that hurt that's done against you personally, as much as you feel justified to hate that person, to hold bitterness to that person, that will only bring destruction, but it will only bring more self-destruction to yourself. But the forgiveness, and forgiveness, there's freedom. And there's, there's grace to be offered in that, to be restored in a fellowship with Christ. And it's only through that forgiveness that we can be restored. And that's amazing. So that's another characteristic as we are to be reflecting Christ. So, so far, we have we are to be humble. We are to be servants. And we are to be forgiven. Another, the fourth one, is he is patient. He is patient. Christ was patient with the multitudes. He escaped the group at one point. He even escaped the group to cross the Sea of Galilee just to see the same group there also, trying to make him king only for what he would offer them. Just because they were like, hey, this guy just, just fed 5,000 people with five barley loaves and two fishes. Who in the universe can do this? Make him king. He's going to satisfy my belly the rest of my days, and I don't have to work uh, an hour of my life. So let's make him king. He was patient even with those people. They missed the point, flat out missed the point, and he was still patient with them. Christ was patient with his disciples. They continued to not understand him and would bicker amongst each other. For example, like who would be the greatest in the kingdom to come? They were his closest friends. They were the people that followed him throughout this world to learn how to even reflect him, to be a testimony of him to the entire, universe, the entire world to represent and bring him to share the grace that he offers. And he was still patient with their inconsistent bickering. Or I should say consistent bickering, but their inconsistent picking up what he's trying to, to teach them. And he was still patient with them. Christ was patient with the non-believing religious leaders who constantly were trying to trap him in his words. He was patient with he didn't just write them off and not answer their, their questions. He used it as an opportunity to be in, to teach those around who were watching. And even in moments where it was just the Pharisees coming to try to trap him more into what he was, and, and, and pin him down on something, to get him to say, oh, he says this, let's go to this group of thought, or let's go to this group of thought. Um, actually, a good example of this, um, I believe it's Matthew 9, I think it's Matthew 9. They come to him asking, um, is it right for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? And they come in with this, and it'd be, there's two schools of thought. One believed that you could divorce a wife for any kind of cause. Another believed that there had to be some sort of writing and something written out um, that it was specific things. If she did this, then you could divorce her. So they were like, ah, we got it. No matter what he says, whether he says, oh, he could divorce for any reason, then we've got him pinned against this group, and we've got someone against him. If he says for only this reason, then we've got another group against him and pin against him for that. And then he turns it right around and answers in grace. And he still gives him a good answer. And he doesn't write them off. He doesn't just ignore them. He gives them an answer. Christ was patient throughout all the beating and scoffing he bore all the way to the cross. And I keep coming back to this because... It is one of the greatest feats of all of history. The greatest is what Christ did for us on the cross. Through this, he went through the questioning, the trials, the being brought before Herod, being brought before the other Roman, um, I believe it was Caesar as well, um, different um, uh, Romans, that was what I'm trying to think of. The different Roman leaders brought before them in different trials and asking questions. And through it all, he had the power to end all of it. And he patiently went through every step, knowing the reward in the end was to save us. And he chose to patiently go through each one of those. That's pretty amazing. And that's the same kind of patience that we are to reflect in our lives to others around us. With ourselves. With, I, I don't know if you're like me, but I'm sure it's, it's a human trait. Uh, I, I am, you are yourself's greatest critic. And I, I find myself many, many times just saying, man, you're an absolute idiot, Chad. What did you do that for? <laughs> I'm going to well, well, you are right. You're going to fall forward. I'm like, idiot, no, you're right. You're an idiot. No, you don't do 
do that to yourself, but then just do that to yourself and then just keep going back and forth. But um, you are your self's greatest critic, so you have to have patience with yourself because recognizing you are human. Patience with other people, recognizing they are human. And patience with God, recognizing his timing is the best timing. Amen. Because he does not guarantee that. Even though you pray something and ask for something, that he will give it right away because he knows that. So we're now, we are to reflect him in humility. We reflect him in as a servant. We reflect him in forgiving, in patience. And that he is compassionate. Several examples, at least six in the Bible are recorded of Christ saying, the Bible recording that Christ has compassion on them. Um, he had compassion on the 5,000. He stopped, took time out of his day. He was tired, he was wore out, and he still fed them. He had compassion on them. He served them. He had compassion on the 4,000, doing like as the same. He had compassion on the blind, two blind men that came before him, and he healed them. He had compassion on the lepers that came before him, and he healed them. And in Mark 5, 19, he had compassion on the two men of Gadara. Gadar, casting out their demons. Christ did not just say, wipe them off as just say, you know, they'll deal with their issues. There's a million other things that I cannot satisfy while I'm physically here as I as he went through his ministry. If you think of it this way, there's so many people that did come to him, but think about all the people that did not come to him that were not able to receive of his healing. He could have just written them off and said, you know, you're part of the other thousands of people that I can't get around to healing at this time. But it says specifically in the Word of God, in Matthew 14, 14, in Matthew 15, 32, in Matthew 20, 34, in Mark 1, 41, and in Mark 5, 19, each reference says that Christ had compassion on us. Are we having compassion on those around us? That can take many forms. That can take the element of putting, in, in, a, in a way, humility, but putting myself aside to seek out the meeting of someone else's need. And that can come by, by way of serving a brother or sister in Christ. And that can come by way of spreading the gospel to a non-believer. I, I honestly, even at this time, as I'm going back to dealing with forgiveness and just in ways having a hardness of heart, it's like I just tend to not care. And there's, there's times that I'm like, man, I, I can make an excuse for myself. I'm going through this right now. I don't have the time to deal with this. I've got college I'm working on. I've got three jobs I'm working. I've got an internship to, to try to help out at this church. And I'm doing all these things, whatever your excuse is, literal just excuses. I don't have time to have compassion for someone else. But we're called to. That's a command. We are to have a representation of reflecting Christ in that capacity. That we are to have a compassion of putting someone else's needs above our own. My challenge to you is this. Are you reflecting Christ in all you with a world in dire need of a humble, serving, forgiving, patient, and compassionate reflection of Christ, are you reflecting Him? Can you look into the mirror and see those characteristics of Christ reflecting back at you? Let us strive to be reflecting Christ in what we do every day and in every way. Yeah, amen. So Dear Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity. You've given me to present your word tonight and just to present what you have laid on my heart, Lord. Um, we thank you so much that you've been such a beautiful and perfect, pure and holy example to us on how we are to live our absolute best life. That will count for not just now, but will count for all of eternity. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to then to develop these areas of our lives, to know how to, and to learn how to, to walk with you in a more pure way, to know how to reflect you better. Help us to ask you the hard questions, to discover those areas of our lives, that we then can learn to reflect you better. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. If you guys are, um, um, as we're thinking through this sermon, and just you want to bow your heads and spend time with the Lord, asking yourself those areas of your lives. Are you meeting these five characteristics? And guys, there's so much more, not just this. You can stay seated, you can stand, either which one. Spend that time with the Lord in prayer and just ask Him to show you the areas that you are becoming a good reflection of Christ. Or are you too focused on yourself? And I'm sorry.
hard to put it down.